Okay. Well, right. <clears throat> Same time, I want to have people have the opportunity to study outside of here. Um, but you got the, like a book thing, right? Where you, I was putting them together, like, like, I think we ran out of space to keep doing that, but she had like letter A through N or M or N that was all in one little, I, I was using our binder, we have a binding machine. And so if you save the copy and you want to have it bound, then you turn it into, with them being printed this way, you probably turn it into about three or four books, you know, three volume set or four volume set. Um, but we can, it doesn't cost anything to run the binder thing and the little comb is like, three cents or something, but uh, it does cost more to do it the way that we're doing it by printing each one um, as opposed to actually having the books made and sent to us. It costs less to have them made and sent to us, but um, over time it costs more, but all at once it's easier to swallow the expense of, of printing and buying toner here and there as opposed to spending, because this two volume set's like 30 bucks for, for two, you know, for one one set of the two volumes. So we'd be printing or we'd be buying, you know, if we bought 10 of them, that's $300. Yeah, well, the toner costs us about 50, it used to cost us $120 every time we had to redo the toner. I found, I found the last time it was like, well, I, it kept going down. It was like 70 and then I think I got it for 40 bucks last time for all four toner cartridges. So, um, yeah, if our black and white printer would duplex, it would make it a whole lot easier. It duplexes when you copy, but it doesn't duplex when you're printing. So anyways, we use our color printer, which costs about 20 cents a page. So you do the math. It costs a lot more to print them than it does to by them yeah it still costs a lot <laughs> because it's still i mean it'll use the black ton toner up real fast and we and then usually right now the deal that i have i have to buy all four to get that deal so we burn through the black toner we're buying the color toner anyway so it's you know <laughs> so anyways we'll talk about that another time let's talk about the holy of holies right now so um, there's a large portion of text that you can read. Um, I'm sure that you all have already read this in anticipation of tonight's study. You've all read Exodus 25 verses, uh, one through 20, or sorry, 10 through 22. And you've read Exodus 37 verses one through nine, right? Okay. Do it. Not right now. Do it later or before. Yes, sir. We're on page 314 in this study. Did you get the study? Okay, great. 314, the Holy of Holies is at the top of the page. Am I giving you the correct page number? All right. 314. Um, what's that? Construction. What? Three. 314. Let me see your book. 314. You have the same study? Holy Holies. That's it. Holy Holies. Yep. Where do you see construction? Right here. Ah, way down there. Okay. Now we're starting top of the page. Top of the page. Sorry, I was with my mom all day, and I forgot to change my shoes, so I get to be more comfortable tonight. I got the, the Holy Crocs. We're talking about the Holy of Holies. Amen. <laughs> so I had to wear my holy, holy, holy shoes tonight. Um, actually, there's a whole lot of holes there. I'm not going to say it that many times. We'll just leave it alone. Um, so the Holy of Holies was the 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits or 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet compartment at the west end of the tabernacle. It was separated from the sanctuary by the veil. I'm going to go ahead and read Hebrews 9, 3 through 5, uh, but I hope you guys have taken the chance or will take the chance to read Exodus 25, verses 10 through 22, and 37, verses 1 through 9. Um, 
and uh, we're gonna we're gonna touch on those passages. And I put them in my text here in case if somebody wants like the the verses that go with this, I can email you a copy of this word document um, with all the all of the uh, scripture. It's uh, so there's 659 of this this side's pages for this one study for the, for letter T. But I have one. I have the scripture for every single study from A through U right now. So. Uh, and I'll, by the time we get done with this study, I'll have all of the text, all the scripture typed out for all the studies from A through Z. So, and I have them all for the ABCs of Christian growth also, if you're interested in, in that. But Hebrews chapter number nine, verse number, verses three through five here. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over the cherubim, and over it the cherubims of glory, uh, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So this is uh, just a quick explanation of this uh, this sanctuary. But it's it's a compartment at the west end of the tabernacle. So all the way over there, we we laid out the tabernacle you know, based on the cardinal directions that it's supposed to be laid out, right? So that's north, in case you didn't know, south, east, west, right? And so the tabernacle is facing the east as, as it was supposed to be facing when, when they, uh, when they uh, set it up. And so facing the east and on the west end of the, the tent part here, this, uh, you can actually feel the wall here. So this space right here, it's 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. You can feel it after right here in this space here. So it is a it is a 15 foot cube. Interesting, uh, interesting thing for you to chew on for just a moment. The New Jerusalem is approximately 1500 miles by 1500 miles by 1500 miles. Interesting. How that might work out. Chew on that for a while. Um, it, it, the city of Lyoth's four square, right? So many furlongs, so many furlongs, which equal up to about 1,500 miles. So the number is 15, 15, 15, 15, 1,500, 1,500, 1,500. Interesting that maybe, maybe the Holy of Holies was a scale of the New Jerusalem. So now, whether or not it was going to be, whether or not the New Jerusalem is, I believe it's cubical because that's what it says. It says it lieth four square. So I don't think it's a, sorry, but I don't think it's a um, pyramid because um, it lieth four square. Square means square, not pyramidical or whatever you, whatever word you'd use. Triangular, four-sided triangle. That's what a pyramid is. It's four sides but it's a triangle. It's four triangles laying on each other. So, um, so let's, you know, um, if, if you think I'm wrong, let me know and explain it to me and we'll do the math and figure it out. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong and, and make myself right if, if I'm, if I'm wrong, but, um, so separated from the sanctuary by the veil. So, where that wall, where you, where I felt that wall there, that ridge, there's a veil going down that. Remember, we already talked about the veil, right, last week. Um, it was here that God would what? Four-letter word, meet. M-E-E-T, meet with man. Exodus 25, 22, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. Uh, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, uh, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I have, I will give uh, thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So he would meet with man there. This is where God put his special presence among his people. Within the holy place were two permanent, permanent, <laughs> permanent items of furniture. I'm sorry. I, I love my family. Um, 
but they're not very particular on how they pronounce things. So all day long, I was listening to uh, my family. And so uh, I just did a lot of listening. I didn't do very much talking really today. I just listened a whole lot. Um, but it was good. It was good to catch up. So amen. So within the holy place were two permanent items of furniture. First of all, the Ark of the Covenant, and secondly, the mercy seat. So you have letter A and letter B. So we're going to try to cover both of those today. And maybe, maybe we will get into the, uh, the building up, the erection of the tabernacle, and uh, what happened to the tabernacle. Um, but probably not. But we may. We'll see. So, letter A, the Ark of the Covenant. This was the centerpiece of the tabernacle. So we're going to look at, just like all the other stuff, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but the same format for every piece has been happening, right? You have the construction, the contents, characterization, right? Or typology, construction, typology, that the same concept of description, right? Uh, breaking down each of these elements. So Exodus 25, uh, verses 10 through 15, being the centerpiece here, um, the Ark of the Covenant says, and they shall make an ark of Shittim wood, uh, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, uh, shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make uh, upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. The two and two rings shall be uh, on the one in the one side of it, and two rings on or in rather the other side of it. Thou shalt make <clears throat> staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark that the ark may be born with them. By the way, that's an important thing. What? Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to those in a minute. We'll get to, the, we'll get to those in a minute. Um, so that's an important thing to note, by the way, which I don't think he points it out here. Um, I don't remember. I don't think he does point it out here, but notice that it says here, that the ark may be born with them, right? So how is, how is the ark supposed to be? This isn't part of your, your study, but how, how is the ark supposed to be transported? Thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark and uh, that the ark may be born with them. They're to be carried, to be transported using the staves, not an ox cart. You'll see the significance of that as you read your Bible and you come across King David and some of the things that happened during his reign. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So there you go. Um, so it's construction. The materials. First, what kind of wood? Shatim wood. Overlaid with what? Gold. The dimensions. How many cubits? Two and a half, right? By, nope, by one and a half, by one and a half. Yeah, two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. So it's, it's like rectangular, but a rectangular cube. So you, it's, it's square this way, length and height, but width, it's a little bit longer, right? So approximately 45 inches long or yeah, we'll, we'll do his, his measurements here. So approximately 45 inches long by 27 inches wide by 27 inches deep. What's that? Not very big at all. So you're, you're looking at uh, 45 inches long, which is what 36 inches is, but it's, it's three and a half feet, right? So three and a half feet, so we'll say if it's if if it's sitting here, it's going to be sitting it's going to be three and a half feet this way, right? And it's going to be two and a half feet this way by two and a half feet tall, right? Or deep if you're considering the inside of it, right? So 
two and a half, two and a half, three and a half. So not very big. This box here is roughly seven feet by three feet. So it's much bigger. <laughs> yes, sir. It is a particular type of wood. We looked that up at the beginning and I forgot. It's, it's like if you say, hey, uh, we want to we want to make a box here and I want you to use uh, maple for the top. Right. So it's a it's a specific type of tree and, and the, the wood that comes from that tree. So. Um, so I don't remember what all this is. There's I, do you remember what the top was made of? But what kind of wood? No, plywood's not a type of wood. Usually, because you can buy plywood, you can buy hard plywood, you can buy soft plywood, you can buy... I was just doing this yesterday because it was an adjusting exercise with my cousin. He was like, what kind of plywood is this? And I was like, you don't know? And he said, I forgot. And I said, okay. So I had to look it up so I could tell him. So like, you, you know what CDX is? No, that's CSX. CDX is a particular type of plywood. Um, the... Uh, the first two letters indicate the the first letter indicates the the front side of the plywood the the grade so the grade is c for the front d is the grade for the back side of it right and then x means it is an exterior plywood so that's what cdx stands for there's also acx which is a on the front so it's a nicer looking front and c on the back right but this is actually the same front and back, except we stained and finished the front and not the back, but, um, or rather the top, not the bottom. But this, this I, I think it's probably, it's probably, um, what'd you say? Pine or poplar? Really? So pines usually, they use pine for chipboard usually. Right. Maple is usually like if you're going to buy a real nice plywood, you're going to buy maple. I'm not sure. I want to say it's oak, but oak is heavier, so it's probably not oak. It's probably a, a pine of some sort or something. But like oak and walnut are heavy woods, heavy, dense, you know, strong woods because they take longer to grow. And pine is usually the reason we use pine so much and and, and maple is because they grow fast and it's soft wood, it's easy to work with. And, but if you wanna have something real nice that's gonna last long and it's not gonna swell and, and, and contract, you want something that's harder wood. So I would suppose that shatim wood is a harder wood that, you know, so. What, Cypress? I don't know, somebody can Google it if they want what shatim wood is, S-H-I-T-T-I-M. What's that? Achaia, not A C I A, right? Or A C I A C A I? Okay. Not is it? Because when I hear that, it, it sounds to me like it's uh, like that that particular type of uh, berry. But you wouldn't think, uh, yeah. Uh, the, I've heard so many different people say it so many different ways. It's like twelve ways to say it. Yes, sir. I would imagine that. <clears throat> well, it would have to be a tree that they would have access to, which would either be found in the Sinai Peninsula, which is where they were wandering, or it was a wood that was found in Egypt before they left. Because find gold in the Sinai Peninsula, they had it with them. So they possibly had wood with them as well. And you say, why would they have wood? Well, they had to carry the stuff. They didn't make metal wheelbarrows back then or, you know, trailers and things like that. I mean, they did. It was there were there were carts and wagons and things like that would all have wood on them. So either they found it in Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula or over in Egypt. So it would have to be first of all, it would have to be a wood that they could find that they could get a hold of. Right. And secondly, it would have to be a wood that I would say it would have to be a wood that's strong, solid. Uh, dense wood because it's going to be overlaid with gold and 
the weathering of it. The gold is going to protect it from weathering, but at the same time, if it expands and contracts very much with heat and cool, being in a desert, it's going to eventually crack the the gold. So it's got to be a wood that's pretty strong, dense wood. So right, well, hard for us. We don't live in the Middle East, so. <laughs> Those were used, uh, some, some of those were used for the temple, not the tabernacle, though. That was another region, slight, well, slightly different area of the same region, but um, yeah, but that's, there's a significance to it. But anyways, um, to answer your question, I just described it, that's all. I would describe what it would have had to have been. Now, you can look up online uh, what they say it is, but I, I can you're going to have to study deeper than just, oh, yeah, it's that tree because it's not a tree that's around here. So they didn't come to Indiana to get the wood that they needed for the Ark of the Covenant. So, um, yes. There's also the possibility that, that it doesn't, it's something that doesn't grow now. Although that wasn't very long ago. And we've, there's, there are trees that we know are very, very, very old trees. Um, but, it, they, it, it might have been redwood. I don't know. They, they went to California and they got the wood and brought it back to, no. <clears throat> they flew in their airplanes and they went to California and, you know, their huge airplane, the aliens brought it to them. There you go. Amen. No. <laughs> I think we have, we have just, di we've just dove off the cliff and into the abyss and we've lost our everything. So, right. Somebody's going to say, Pastor Campbell, believes that aliens built the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, no, Pastor Campbell does not believe that aliens built the Ark of the Covenant. Um, right. Uh, well, they were immigrants. <laughs> they, they were strangers, sojourners, pilgrims. Um, but they turned to flight the armies of the aliens, so they were not themselves aliens, except they kind of they kind of were actually, they were strangers in a strange land. That's exactly right. So I guess that's true. Aliens did build the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> but not from the perspective that most people think of aliens. They weren't extraterrestrials. They were just not citizens of the land that they were sojourning and the land in which they were sojourning. So that's exactly right. Amen. He said, come on, preacher, let's get on with it. Amen. All right. Um, <clears throat> So we got the dimensions, we got the, 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 the uh, materials, um, and I, I kind of already really kind of got to the particular about uh, the permanent uh, things that were supposed to be carrying it, right? So what was it? The, uh, the two permanent wood slash gold, what? Staves uh, passing through four rings of gold. Um, and... Uh, so it's contents. Anybody remember without going to the passage? The contents of the Ark of the Covenant. Hello. Come on in. All right. The, the Aaron's rod that budded. The tables of the covenant. And the golden. Nope. Pot of manna. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so you have the, in Hebrews 9, verse 4, it, describes which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant uh overlaid round about with gold wherein was the golden pot uh that what that had manna right so describing the uh ark of the covenant overlaid with gold wherein was the golden pot that had manna and aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant amen so it's character characterization a beautiful picture of Christ in its construction an emblem of his perfect humanity and deity, right? Wood symbolizing humanity, symbolizing deity. Um, in its designation, ark being a place of refuge, right? Uh, in Hebrews 11 verse 7, it says, by faith, Noah being warned of God of things uh, not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which 
or by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So this is a, a place of refuge. The other example, the word ark being used here, Exodus 2, 3, it says, and when she could not uh, longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it uh, in the flags by the river's brink. So again, the, this is a place of refuge, a place of safety uh, and protection from the outside world. So um, it's preeminence as the item detailed first by the Lord in his construction for the tabernacle in Colossians uh, 1 verse 18. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the first or who is the beginning uh, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. So just as the ark had had the preeminence in the, the, the um, matters con, uh, relating to the tabernacle, Christ has the preeminence in matters relating to everything, but more specifically the church, right? Um, so it's contents, the tables of the law. Jesus both kept the law, Hebrews 7, 26. Come on in. He both kept the law for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. So he kept the law and he um, fulfilled the law, right? In uh, Matthew chapter five, verse 17, it says, uh, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. So not only did he keep the law, but he fulfilled the law. And uh, by meeting, and, and he did so by meeting its demands upon sin. What were the demands of sin? Death, right? And Christ uh, died for our sin. And he is the Holy One. He is the one who did no sin, right? No N-O. He did no sin, right? There was no sin found in him. And he knew no sin, right? But he became sin for us. He fulfilled the law, kept the law, fulfilled the law, and satisfied the law on our behalf. So the the uh, <clears throat> the the contents of the of the Ark of the Covenant, the first content there being the the tables of the covenant or the the uh, the Ten Commandments, right? The law, they're symbolizing or pointing us to Christ who fulfilled the law, right? Um, and then the manna. <clears throat> let's look here at uh, something that the Lord said in John chapter six, verse number 31 through 35, our fathers, actually the Lord didn't say this, the others said it, and then he responds. So um, the, uh, look at some Pharisees he's talking to here, uh, or the, the religious leaders of the day, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. But my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So he gives us this, this uh, picture true happening that took place in the Old Testament. They had the manna that, that uh, the Father gave them, but the manna was there as a sign for the bread of heaven, the bread of life, who was to come and fulfill all hunger, right, from a spiritual perspective. And so satisfying the sinner, Christ is the all-sufficient one. And then the, the last thing there, Aaron's rod that budded. Um, let's look at some passages here. Related to that, actually, um, the manna also, uh, he, he goes on to say uh, about the manna, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, or you, uh, he that believeth on me, and uh, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... Uh, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I, which I will give for the life of the world. 
The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen. Now people get this really confused. Understand that he was not speaking from a physical perspective. He wasn't saying, hey, y'all come over here and take a bite. He wasn't saying that from a physical perspective. He just continued on their train of thought, but from a spiritual perspective dealing with this. And by the way, he wasn't talking about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of his body and his blood. Uh, what he's talking about is that we eat of him, of the bread. We do so by faith, right? Uh, and, and we believe on him, right? We believe in what he has done for us. Uh, so about the rod, Numbers chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, and all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet you. Rather, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that... The man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of the, their princes gave him a rod apiece for one prince, one, uh, or I'm sorry, for each prince, one, according to their father's houses, even 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded. And it brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty neat. Um, Let's look here at John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Just like the rod that was dead, but blossomed. Right? Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it says, "Now, uh, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Right? He was dead in the grave. Because he died for us, yet he liveth evermore, right? And so he is the one who can bring life from the dead. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is the rod that was placed in that Ark of the Covenant. And so doing, symbolizing Christ and his power and how, uh, how he is all-powerful, able to bring life even from the dead um so any thoughts on the ark of the covenant or the, those things i'm thinking we're going to go ahead and continue to do the, talk about the mercy seat real quick here and then we'll then we'll cut for prayer time all right so the mercy seat over on the next page this served as the lid of the ark of the covenant <clears throat> you can see its construction Exodus 25, verses 17 through 20. We're going to look at that real quick here. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Shalt thou make them 
in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall, uh, shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. So, it's made of what? Pure gold, made with two cherubims of gold, located on each end of the mercy seat. Their wings covered the mercy seat, and their faces, their faces looked to one another uh, and toward the mercy seat. Oh, you're reading off of his? Uh-oh. <laughs> there you go. Well, teamwork. Well, see, there you go. You speak it, he writes it, right? There you go, amen. All right, so it's typology. We'll look here quickly at the typology of the mercy seat. Gold speaks of deity. Mercy extends from God, right? It's called the mercy seat uh, for a reason, because that mercy comes from God. Uh, let her be here. According to Leviticus 16, 15, it was... All right, somebody got it. Sprinkled with blood. Uh, changing it from precious to priceless. Let's look here in uh, Leviticus 16, 15. Then uh, shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Uh, this makes it, uh, as, as he says here, that it changes it from precious gold to priceless gold redemption right the picture still being right that you have god who is precious to us but then when he died and his blood was shed for us he became priceless to us right became of such value to give us eternal life it is called a seat signifying completion um, hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 and 12 and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, speaking of Jesus, sat down on the right hand of God. Amen. He completed his task. So he was able to sit down because he was done. That's why all of you are sitting, right? Because you're done. You've completed your tasks for the day. Uh <clears throat> Letter D, it covered the contents of the ark, which, as they relate to man, speak of the law, right? As we already mentioned, man broke uh, the law. Man's transgression and guilt, all based upon the law. The manna, man's murmuring, complaining, and ungratefulness. The rod, man's rebellion. Each of those things point that out, but the mercy seat covers them. Isn't that neat? Greek word translated mercy seat in Hebrews 9 5 is also translated propitiation in Romans 3 25. Isn't that interesting? Right? The mercy seat there in Romans 3 25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a mercy seat, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that we should change the word to mercy seat. Just understand it's the same Greek word. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's interchangeable. Propitiation is necessary because it makes sense there, right? So, but he became a propitiation. You say, well, what's that? Well, it's the seat that covers your sin, right? <clears throat> the mercy seat. So, uh, also, the same word is used in uh, 1 John uh 410, it says, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. <clears throat> then uh, 
as he says here, the word literally means, or, or we, could, we could understand it to mean covering, right? Something that covers that, uh, that broken law, the murmuring, complaining, ungratefulness, the guilt, the transgression, the rebellion, that mercy seat, that propitiation, it covers. It is the covering. The mercy seat covers it all. Amen. Uh, Psalm 32, verse 2. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Amen. The ark pictures Christ as he relates to the Father. The mercy seat pictures Christ as he relates to the sinner. Amen. Any questions there? On that. The tabernacle has become almost a whole credit hour course. <laughs> um, next week will be the 13th week in letter T. Uh, Lord willing, we will finish next week. However, there is a possibility that we may end up not finishing until the following week. But we've, we've got two major sections here at the end. Uh, we're going to deal with the erection of the tabernacle, the obedience of Moses, the cloud of glory, the dwelling place of God. That's a lot of stuff to talk about, right? And then the next major section there is what happened to the tabernacle. We're going to look at the journeys of the tabernacle and the judgments of the tabernacle. We may be able to fit all of that into one, but uh, we shall see. No questions? How much discussion? All right. Well, let's go ahead and stop the feed and we will pick up there next week and we'll go ahead and do prayer requests. You can turn channel one back on.